Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to the 2020 Suffrage Science Awards Night, the most glamorous awards night of the year. All I can say is how sorry we are that we can't be with you in person. I personally love awards. Um, I will say though that, you know, there are a few advantages to having an online awards ceremony. I will admit that I haven't put on a pair of tights since March and tonight has not changed that. But in honor of the event, I have put on my good bra. So there is that. Uh, other things that I do miss about awards in person, apart from being able to meet amazing people and have a, a really wonderful time celebrating women in science is the canapes. It's the little things you miss. So I've actually made my own award ceremony canapes, my little piece of slate. So uh, perhaps, you know, you may wish to, to go and make some canapes and join us later and drink them with a warm glass of cheap Prosecco. So we're going to miss all of that, but we are all here. We have more than a hundred people joining us from all over the place and we just have a wonderful night ahead of us. So over the next hour, we are going to really celebrate women in science. We have apparently 121 people joining us so far. Now, this is the Suffrage Science Awards. So just to give you a quick overview of what the scheme is, many of you will already know, but the idea of it is that there are pieces of heirloom jewellery that are passed on by amazing women in science to amazing women in science. We now have three schemes running. We have the life sciences, we have maths and computing, and we have engineering and the physical sciences. And so every two years, someone will pass on that piece of jewellery. This is now, we're coming into our 10th year next year of suffrage science, and it's been a real privilege to, I think I've been involved from almost the very beginning, and there are now uh, 126 women who've been awarded these pieces of jewellery and passed them on, and tonight another 22 will join that, that hallowed ranks. So it's creating an incredible network of incredible women all over the world, supporting each other and promoting the cause of, of women in science. Now, this is the sixth Life Sciences Award tonight and the third Maths and Computing Award, and we are absolutely delighted to welcome you. Now, let me give you a really quick breakdown of the running order, what's going to happen. We're now doing the welcome. That's this bit. And shortly after that, I am going to uh, introduce the Life Sciences video premiere. So we'll have a little video talking about the Life Sciences Awards. We're then going to have a panel discussion for about half an hour talking about some of the key themes that have emerged during 2020. Uh, don't know if anyone has noticed some key themes emerging. And uh, we can also follow that with Q&A. So please do uh, give us your questions. Our, our panellists are really amazing women and they would love to talk and answer your questions. Then we'll have another short film looking at the Maths and Computing Awards for this year. Then we'll wrap it all up and we'll be over by seven o'clock. Now, a couple of things to explain about the internet portal that we are coming to you through. So there is obviously the live feed where you can see my face and you can see the running order. We do have the chat. You can find the chat on the right of the screen. Please use that just as a, a way of explanation. The chat can be seen by everyone but it can't be seen by me and it can't be seen by the panelists. So this is a place for you to share your reactions, check in, say who you are, where you're from, share your photos, say hi, uh, how you're reacting and responding to the evening. So please use the chat to chat. If you have questions for the panelists, once the panel gets going, please put them in the Q&A box under here. So Q&A for questions, we'll be seeing those, but we can't see the chat. That's for uh, you to play amongst yourselves. There are a couple of other things. So there's also the attendee list. So you'll be able to see that. That's probably up there. Um, everyone who is attending, they're listed there. And if people have consented to have their email there, it's there. So you can reach out, make connections, share your reactions and all that kind of thing. If you don't want to have your email there or you want to check, you can also check your kind of priorities uh, there as well. So you can have a quick look at that. There's also the feedback form up there. Please, please, please do leave us your feedback after the event because this is obviously a new experience for us running this event online and we would love to hear what you think and, and your views of the, the evening and the, the event. So I think that is pretty much everything. One more thing, we are recording this event. We're going to be making the recording available afterwards for people to watch. So if you do leave a question in the Q&A box and you don't want your name read out, just don't put your name. If you do want your name read out, just add your name at the end. So just so you know. So I think we are nearly there. And the next thing that I have to do is introduce our amazing panel. 
So we are really privileged tonight to be joined by three incredible panellists. I'm so happy that everyone was able to, to do this panel tonight. So our first panellist um, is Anne-Marie Imafadon, MBE. She's Thought Leader, Advisor, Pioneer for Diversity and Balance in Science and Technology. She's the co-founder of STEMETS, which is an award-winning social initiative dedicated to inspiring and promoting the next generation of women in the STEM sectors. And she's reached tens of thousands of people across Europe. It's absolutely fantastic, her work. And she is the winner of one of the Maths and Computing Suffrage Science Awards today. So congratulations, Anne-Marie. We're also joined by Lakeisha Jean. She's the founder of Girls in Science, which is another wonderful organization that presents the realities of what it's like to have a career in science and technology. She sort of unpacks the lives and explains what, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of what a qualification in science can do for you highlighting the incredible range of career opportunities that are available and advice and tips for how to navigate that journey. Um, based on my personal experience of being a woman in science, I really want to know if it's possible that they've got a tip for how to make a balanced meal out of the vending machine in your research institute, because that, that was my biggest challenge. And we're also joined by Jenny Roan, who is the former winner of one of our Life Sciences Awards in 2014. And Jenny runs her own research group at UCL. She looks at the bacteria that underpin chronic uh, urinary tract infections, um, a problem that affects many, many women as well as men. And it's she's also a writer. She's published three novels set in the world of scientific research and even coined the genre lab lit to describe them. And she was the founder and chair of Science is Vital. It was a grassroots campaign organisation that was set up to combat the threats to science funding in the UK. So we have three incredibly passionate and wonderful women who uh, we're going to be talking later in the panel discussion to. So before we get to that, it is time to look at the story of how the Suffrage Science Awards came to be and also meet our Life Sciences awardees for this year. Now, the Suffrage Science Awards scheme basically works through these pieces of incredible heirloom jewellery. So when the, science, the scheme was set up in the beginning, you know, there was some discussion about what this should be. The idea of heirloom jewellery that gets passed on. This is not something we own, but we merely look after it for the next generation. And the award ceremonies for the past nine years have involved people coming together and handing over those pieces of jewellery in person. Obviously that can't happen. This has happened at a distance. So we've put together these little videos to uh, introduce you to the awardees and the givers of each award. So these have been produced by uh, Kiki von Glasau and her team and uh, this reflects on how the awards began and we'll get a chance to meet all the awardees. So this is the Life Sciences. Please sit back, relax and enjoy our little film. I chose Elspeth as the recipient because she's been an inspiration to me since I was a PhD student. I think that she was um, impressed by my ability with vacuum systems and electronics and computers. That was all 33 years ago, uh, but she's never forgotten this. The three things I want for women in science are equal pay, equal recognition and equal voice. I'd like to build on the foundations of the Me Too movement to ostracise the pervasive misogyny that is still present in science. I would like to encourage female scientists 
to conduct medical research that focuses exclusively on women's health and on disadvantaged populations. What can we do to make the field more equitable for current and the next generation of female scientists? I think what we do need, and especially now during pandemic times, is flexibility as people try to balance work and family and other demands on their time. We need to be able to pace ourselves and feel that we're still moving forward, still contributing, uh, still a part of that community of scientists. The recipient of my alum is Gizu van der Goot. Um, Gizu is a professor uh, of life sciences at the EPFL in Lausanne. She's also dean of the faculty there, and she will soon become vice president for responsible transformation at the EPFL as well. So Irene and I met uh, several times, and we had a very good contact, both scientifically and human. And I was actually really surprised when she chose me because we haven't met very often. So I guess it's because she uh, appreciates a balance between a good scientist and a good human. What two questions would you like to ask the current holder? What do you think are the most important questions in human memory research right now? And do you think we will have an effective treatment for brain aging or Alzheimer's disease in our lifetime? The three things that I would encourage female scientists can be summed as the three C's. Courage, confidence and camaraderie. Being nominated by Anat for this award for me has been incredibly empowering and, and it's not something that I, that I was expecting. She is a great researcher but she's also a leader and a role model for young researchers especially female ones. We should also be better at leading by example I think so we can't uh, promote uh, equality and, and inclusion and then being workaholic. Cécile Martina is a founding member and since 2015 the director of iSTEM. She's an expert in stem cells, which she elegantly exploits for the study of neuromuscular diseases. I chose Cécile not only for her obvious scientific qualities, but also for her generosity and her tireless investment for the community. first thing about women science I want to change is to have more women in all fields of science. I chose Kelly for the Suffrage Science Award because I think that she has this very unique combination of tenacity, rigor, and optimism that makes her a, a force to be reckoned with in, in science and in particular structural biology. I myself have been very lucky to have supportive mentors and colleagues. I hope that this would be extended to other women in science as well. And this is usually very empowering. Sina Warp was a professor of anatomy at University of California, San Francisco. I am uh, very grateful that I was able to share with Sina before her passing um, why I nominated her that this was my way of showing her gratitude for, um, for her mentorship and um, my respect for all her scientific work. I chose Sina for this award because she was a trailblazer for uh, women in science. At her passing in June, Twitter lit up with stories from many, many women sharing how they had been inspired in their career by Sina's. I chose Veronique because she has the best qualities for being a great role model for women in science, both in her success in leading an innovative research program and her ability to be a supportive group leader, great mentor and champion of women in science. I have a passion for both research and for improving the research culture. I strongly believe that you can be dedicated to both pursuits, so I'm very excited about an award that recognizes this dedication.
Mandy's best known work deals with the ecology of deep sea microbial communities and with the biogeochemical consequences of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. She spoke out about the extent of the Gulf oil spill in 2010, and she has been advocating for climate change awareness for over a decade. What I think is important for any researcher is to find an area that is fascinating to them. She just has this most amazing ability to communicate really complex ideas into simple words that other people can understand. Um, and I th just think that everybody should have a role model like Carolyn and I want to be that role model for other people. I'm sorry to sound like Tony Blair, but the three things are self-confidence, self-confidence, and self-confidence. What a fantastic message. Um, we would also like to uh, spend a moment thinking about the life of Zena Werb, who's one of our awardees this year who sadly passed away. She did know that she'd been awarded the Suffrage Science Award and I think we think it was the last award that she was given and um, she was a, a great mentor, great scientist to so many people so um, we, we do acknowledge her passing very sadly. I wanted to bring in the rest of the panel for a quick chat and any responses to the video. Jenny you were one of our Life Science awardees, would you rather have a race car? Uh, <laughs> what did your award mean to you? I really loved it. I, I wore it. Actually, I know some awardees were too afraid to wear the jewelry, but I wore it uh, uh, to occasions and I always got comments like, what is that amazing piece? I don't think you mentioned, but they were designed by artists. Um, I can't remember which art school, maybe the Slade? Uh, it was Central St. Martin's. Central St. Martin's. And they're be actually really unusual pieces. Uh, and and I, I wore it with pride, even though I was a little bit scared I might lose it. But, but yeah, the beautiful, the beautiful idea. They are incredible pieces as each of the branches, the life sciences, the maths and computing, the physics and engineering, all the jewellery is kind of shaped around themes from, from that branch of science. So it's it's very clever. Um, Lakeisha and, and Anne-Marie, uh, Lakeisha, do you have any, what were your thoughts upon seeing the video? I think just the whole international spectrum of different people and personalities were really interesting. I would see a video come up and I'm like, I wonder where this person's from. I think just having that global community is really significant and it just makes this awards evening really super special. And Marie, any reflections from you on the, uh, the life sciences? Yeah, I think it was nice seeing the connections that each person has. I think it was always something slightly different. That was their reason why they nominated and passed it forward. So it got me thinking, <laughs> I don't know if this is because I'm a computer scientist, but what's the tree? How do we track back these kind of relationships? Is there like a mapping almost or a way that we've been able to visually represent the kind of the relationships of passing it forward, but also between other computer scientists and other life scientists, um, sorry, who might have uh, got it over the last 10 years. So uh, that, that was where my mind went. It's interesting. There's also some, sometimes people talk about the idea of, you know, a lab legacy. And I think suffrage science now has been going long enough to have that fantastic legacy of, of women all over the world. Um, if you want to know more about the Life Science Awardees for this year, you can find all about them on the Suffrage Science website. And uh, there'll be a link to the chat if you're interested in reading about that. It's got of interviews and, and more in depth about each of our awardees this year. So now, we move on to the kind of the uh, the meaty part of the evening, which is our panel discussion. So it's it's hard to think about a way of bringing in a panel discussion about women in science without thinking about the overarching thing that has been on our minds most of this year, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. And certainly from what I've seen, COVID-19 has really felt like an accelerator and a magnifier of change and of the issues that are affecting us and particularly for women. So I thought I would start by asking each of the panelists to talk a little bit about some of the impacts of the pandemic on, on their work and also on their communities, uh, the wider sort of STEM communities you're engaged in. So I think as a practicing scientist, Jenny, you get to, you get to go first here, having been at the, the sharp end in the lab over this time. Yes, I think it's been incredibly distressing all over the world, labs closed down for three or four months, pretty much universally. And you now when you're looking after a group of young people whose careers depend upon being in a laboratory, 
or field station uh, that's closed. It, it's really difficult and, and, and it's, no, it's unprecedented. I know that word's been overused. I think um, for me, what's been most distressing are the data coming out that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected women in science. So their publication records, for example, and their job prospects. And it's probably something to do with the fact that most uh, most of the caregiving during these times when kids were off school was, was done by the women. I mean, I, I'm lucky to have a really supportive uh, spouse who, who is very, very hands-on, but I know a lot of women that I know in science didn't have that safety net and they were pretty much looking after their children the whole time and trying to hold hold down a full-time job. So yeah, th th I don't know how long it's going to take to get out of this, but that's when you say it's accelerated a problem that was already there, that's definitely true and that there's data to support that. Yeah, it feels like it's really masked that sort of fragility of everyone was just about holding it together. And exactly. then when something changes, it it doesn't work. Um, Anne-Marie, has, has this been your experience in the work that you're doing in, in your STEM community? Yeah, I think definitely. And it, it's been the kind of the, the other side or the other thing that we've seen kind of magnified much more has been this device and data poverty that we've got across the country. So for us, you know, we've always prided ourselves at STEMETS at running inclusive environments you know people can come for a hot meal you know it's free it's fun they can come and spend the day and we give them everything they need they don't they literally come empty-handed we'll fill your stomach and we'll put a laptop in your hands or whatever it or you know or, or a test tube or whatever we might need for that day and so for us what's been really magnified during this time has been you know those young people who don't have a device at home don't have stable internet at home and the fact that we've had to build that into our provision so we've I'm still waiting for a couple to come back now but we've had a load of laptops that have gone out we paid for data packages for lots of girls um, and non-binary young people up and down the country and I think what we've seen is yeah you know there's there's so much people leave behind at home whether it's care and responsibilities like we just um, heard from Jenny or you know whether it's there's all kinds of things that people people have that they're masking or they're having to hide or you know that aren't built into the way that we do things um, and so I think uh, there's been so much acceleration of things that we already knew were there problems that we already knew we had it's just now it's been harder to turn away from them and look away from them so there definitely has been that sense of you know not even just working from home you're working at home during a pandemic Right, with all the other responsibilities that, that you already had. So we, we've seen that definitely. Lakeisha, what's been your experience during this time? Yeah, so a lot of the girls in our community have found it really hard in terms of establishing good support systems. I think this whole isolation is a killer thing. It's, it's real and um, it's good to have your parents support you. But when you have your classmates that give you that competitive edge and your teachers that help you and you can ask questions at the end of the lesson, when that's stripped away, it really exposes um, a real sort of void in terms of young people's learning abilities and their ability to absorb information. And I think just the stress um, of a lot of girls, particularly that I know that GCSEs and A-levels and not knowing what to do, even now that they've gone back, um, uncertainties of teachers being there and class isolation, it's really, it feels like that it's imploding for them and they feel like they're in it alone. Um, and I think that's why all the communities, this community and everyone involved, it's so important to give that sort of moral support to let everyone know that everyone's facing the exact same thing. Universities aren't going to hate you. They know what's going on. Um, it's just one of those times where one kind of has to pull in together. Jenny, have you found from, from your university, from the academic community, that, that people are really acknowledging that women have done the burden of the work this time and, and are having these issues? So what support has come from the academic community? I, I'm not really aware of, of that. I mean, to be honest with you, gender is not mentioned in any of the sort of university missives. I mean, obviously everybody's struggling. and. There hasn't been, I mean, we were allowed to work flexibly, of course, and I think academia is a pretty good place to be for flexible working. It's always been flexible. You've always been able to leave the lab and nip down to pick up your kid or whatever. So in some ways, academia is is a good is a good business to be in if you need flexible support and, and childcare. But on the other hand, it's a, it's a relentless and ruthless profession where uh, your outputs determine your success. And, and if women's outputs are 
By that, I mean papers and grants. If those are going down disproportionately compared to men, they're not going to be able to compete even when the pandemic is over. So taking a hit now will, will have a long term effect for many women, I think. One of the other things that I saw that had been reported was that female experts were being called on less during um, to, you know, to, to give media interviews and, and generally for responding to the pandemic. I wanted to bring that to Lakeisha because part of what you do is showcasing the kinds of careers and opportunities that women with scientific backgrounds can do. I mean, even just something like representation in commenting on the media must be really important for girls to see that women can have a voice for science. 100%. Females need to be established as figures of authority in every area um, and especially in an industry like this where you're right, the representation is dismal at the moment. Um, I feel like um, it's weird because I think this conversation is is being talked about and it's very prevalent in our circles. But in terms of actions and, and putting things, I've heard a couple of people who are putting things together for various events and they were like, oh, we couldn't call on her because childcare measures or we couldn't because she was busy sort of thing. So I personally, I'd like to think, I'm a bit of an optimist, I'd like to think that it's not always people are just saying we don't want women on the panel, we don't want people to be interviewed. But again, like earlier on, like it's these systemic things that... Um, do play and kind of have that ripple effect so that if you have um, interviews with scientists to talk about COVID, for example, and it's all men, it, it goes somewhere. And I think it can be sort of like mentally, even subconsciously, like ingested by the people that are watching it. You don't want women to take the back seat in a time where all opinions need to be counted for. Yeah, and that's, I think that's a good point to move the discussion on to one of the other big themes of 2020, which has been you know, the issues of diversity. And we've seen the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, I've seen some amazing things happening um, to, to raise the profile of, of black scientists, scientists of colour, all sorts of different um, minority scientists. But, you know, some of it does feel a bit that this is performative for social media rather than actual change. I think Anne-Marie, I'd, I'd like to bring you in here is, you know, that this there is a conversation happening, the discourse is happening. Does it feel like it is different this time round? Um, in some ways, yes. In many ways, no. And I think it, it's one of those things that, you know, like you said, it's a lot of discussion. Um, but, it, you know, I, I've been black for 30 years. So, you know, we can discuss what's been happening as much as we want, but discussing it doesn't change it really. So I think it, it's definitely what I'm seeing is um, there's discussion um, and that's led to almost kind of paralysis. People are reading books, we're reading Superior, they're reading, you know, why I'm no longer talking about race, reading all the right things. And like you're saying, kind of there's almost the performative level of, yeah, I've, I've academically taken this on, I've understood what's going on. But then that next step of now do something as a result of what you've read and what you've understood, we're not seeing as much. So I think it's a little bit to what uh, Jenny was just saying of, you know, you, you have to talk about the problem and admit it first to then start doing, but what are we structurally deciding to do? You know, has as UKRI read that open letter? You know, are, are these discussions happening? Are we, you know, are we looking at hiring? There are still 25 black professors in, in the UK, 25, right? There's, there's more women in suffrage science than there are black female professors alive today in our system and so I think that there's a lot more action that we need to be done but people also I mean we're scientists right we're, it's about experimenting you learn and then you move forward and I think people need to have the same kind of growth mindset but iterative approach to say we know it's not great we've read all the things that we need to read now we're going to start acting now we're going to start doing and we know we're going to make mistakes right we know those groups are there for us to listen to and we know we need to figure this out but we're going to we're not going to use that as an excuse to not have any progress at all yeah i did want to talk about the idea of you know, doing something and i i would like to sort of end the discussion by thinking about really practical steps because it, sometimes when you're faced with like we've got to dismantle the patriarchy we've got to dismantle systemic racism like i'm only five feet tall I, I can't do it right now. Um, but in that that idea of like now is the time for action, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about the balance between needing to do the work and then worrying about that all the work is falling on women and particularly women of colour to do the work. So is, is there sort of a balance to be struck? Uh, Lakeisha, do you have some, some thoughts there? No, I, I, I do get what you mean. I feel like 
what we need to do is have this ideology change whereby we don't see it as them and us in either case. And I think once we do that and we have this collective voice, everyone can feel like they're playing a part. And you're right. Like I, I look at that and I look sometimes at the stuff that I've done, the media content I've done. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's not enough ethnic minorities. It's terrible. I'm a terrible person. But I just feel like if everyone can um, look within their own personal circles, I have this just a really interesting concept of like you as an individual no one else has the same circle as you from your school to um extracurricular activities to your church or whatever you're involved in like no one has your circle if you can make a small indent in the few people that you know and everyone collectively does that um and being aware and feeling confident enough to speak up um, there's times where racial things have happened in front of me um, and I haven't had the confidence to speak up. I think for me personally, what this movement has done more than anything has given me almost like a bit of a permission to say that, OK, this isn't OK. What can we do? Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it needs to definitely be long term and we can't take it all on our shoulders to solve immediately right now. It needs to be something that um, kind of sticks in the back of our minds long term. Yeah. I know that all three of us, uh, all three of you, we've had discussions um, last week about the kinds of things we wanted to talk about. And one of the themes that really came through in all the conversations I had with you was the idea about belonging. It's, it's making women and, and making women of colour and, and girls feel like they belong in science. So what can we do to make people feel like they belong? I feel it's very sad that we can't have events where people can go in and see people who look like them and, and feel that sort of allyship where like, I'm one of only two women in the room, we must talk to each other. Um, Jenny, how, how do you sort of feel about this idea of helping people to feel like they belong in science? I think the, the bottom line is, if, as you say, if you don't see anyone who looks like you, you're not going to belong. And, and we have to just bend over backwards to get diversity into everything that we do, everything that, that, that we project. We need to have everybody at the table and, and yes, it's easy to say, well, I called up the one woman or I called up the one person of color I knew and she said no. It's, it's very easy to do, but you could call up, you know, five people, you can call up 10 people, you can keep trying until you succeed. And, and I think we just have to keep trying to, to have these role models present so that when somebody comes into the room, there is more than one of them there. And, and I, I know it's not easy because as, as, as you've been saying, it might fall disproportionately on the, the minority people, whether that be women or people of color, to always show up at, at all the events, to be almost like a token person. But I think if we just keep trying to be inclusive, it's, it, it will make a difference. Yeah, I've, I've actually changed, sort of slightly changed fields, and I'm now working more in the, the world of communication. So there's so many events I turn up to, it's just like 30 guys called Matt in check shirts. I'm like, OK. <laughs> Yeah, this is a bit weird. I mean, Anne Marie, what, what Jenny said about, you know, you must be someone who's constantly in demand. I feel incredibly privileged that we've got you on the panel. How, how are you trying to get over the, the feeling of like you're always the person who feels like they're asked to do all the events? I say no. Often. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm getting better at saying no. Um, but in saying no, I'm like, you know, there's Lakeisha, there's Nike, there's Yawande, there's you know, I've literally got a list of people that I can reel off and say, OK, cool, we're going to we're going to divvy up the work. But the other thing that I think we have to be we have to have a plan. We have to be intentional. And we have to say, do you know what? I invited that one black woman that I know and she couldn't make it. And it's like, OK, cool. So what did you then do when she couldn't make it? Did you make sure she had childcare? Did you ask her to pre-record? Did you change you know, the, the time that you were doing it? Did you widen the criteria or change the question? to mean that it wasn't just that black one black woman that was eligible to come, that there were other people that were eligible to come. So I think we all, you know, it's in every decision, every action, every interaction is an opportunity for us to allow, to let people know that they belong, to listen to them and to show that there's value in them. And so I think we definitely have to be, you know, if you, if you don't, if you, un, if you don't intentionally include, you unintentionally exclude. And I think there's something that we all need to get into that habit of every single time you're making a selection, every single time you're putting a name forward, every, you know, this next year or next iteration of, uh, you know, passing it forward. We've got to be really intentional with who are we picking up, who are we selecting? 
And what are we doing? You know, I, I say this to people all the time. If you're running a panel event, you know, and, and there's no woman that you think that's eligible, then maybe you've asked the wrong question. Maybe you've got the wrong topic. Maybe you're operating at the wrong time. And I think we have to be really honest with ourselves to say, you know, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you, you've always got. And so now we have to say, well, OK, that's not good enough. You know, um, Jenny made a, made a point about outputs. You know, is it just grants and papers that we should be measuring people on? Do we measure their process? instead of their outputs, you know, how different would science be if that's what we were tracking? And so I think it's really important for us to say, OK, cool, we, we need to change the whole system. And that takes decisive and intentional steps by all of us, because the culture is the average of all of our actions. And so, you know, we all get this. We're all scientists, we're mathematicians, we get it. You know, you can move the average. <laughs> we're still counting votes now, right? A lot of things can move in just, just the actions of one person. And so I think it's really important for us to understand we've all got agency um, and that's for white women, that's for black women, that's for white men, that's for allies. Everyone has that agency. And so it's something that we're all doing. Black women on their own can't change that average. White women on their own can't change that average. Women on their own can't change that average. We're in a minority. And so it's how do we get everyone to pull the average in the right direction and say, you know, that that's how they did it 100 years ago. We're not 100 years ago, so maybe we shouldn't have a panel. You know, it, it's, there's all these things that it's like, well, we throw it out completely and start again. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to encourage everyone that is listening, you know, what what's the difference? What's the moonshot? You know, what's the experimental that you can do and that you can pioneer and, and you know, learn, learn from your mistakes and allow others to learn from your mistakes? You know, if that difference in that panel, difference in that event, difference in that way of doing research, different in that way of picking collaborators work for you, tell others. And we can all continue to pull in the right direction. I think that's wonderful. It, it's nice to know that, like, you can get stuff wrong. Like, this isn't. No one's out of the box perfect, uh, for sure. This stuff is not is not easy. Um, I sort of wanted to move the conversation slightly forward to the idea of mentorship, and this seems to be so important to so many women um, in their careers in science, and and certainly. From my perspective, I find it really important to be mentoring uh, in my field in science communication, to be mentoring and, and helping people come along. But, you know, where, what does make a good mentor? Do you have to have a mentor who is like you? Uh, this is that sort of idea of like, you know, if, you, if you're a black woman, do you have to have a black woman as a mentor? If you're a white woman, do you have to have a white woman as a mentor? Um, Lakeisha, I know you do a lot of like trying to get girls and, and, and to see what what the future can be like for them. What's your thought on this? Yeah, I remember speaking to you about this because the first mentor that I met and probably the most significant one was a white 60 year old male. <laughs> and um, I met him during secondary school. He opened so many doors for me, gave me so many incredible opportunities. And it's something I like to call personality alignment. So I think sort of like further on, I do have more female um, role models. Not a lot of them are ethnic minorities. It's quite a good mix. Um, but it really is about someone taking the time to see the personality of someone, gauge if they're keen or they're interested and just form a really organic relationship. And I don't think it has to be too structured. Sometimes I get a bit of anxiety when it's like every six weeks we must meet at 5 p.m., you know, <laughs> but um, whether it's just like tagging people into um like articles on LinkedIn or just retweeting things. Um, I remember you saying, Kat, that you say um, that, you know, if everyone, anyone wants to ask about science communications, you can just DM me. I think that's just such a huge um, avenue because that's where all, that's where everyone is. We're on social media. And because of that, people are a lot more accessible than perhaps they would have been a couple of years ago. Um, so I think it's important to have a good mix. I feel like from, I'm not necessarily mentoring anyone in their career. I feel like I've just started, but I feel like um, from the opposite spectrum, um, look out for people that you like aspects of their career, you like aspects of their personality. You're not de designated to become their clone, but if you like things in someone and you get a good combination of people, you can almost like create the person that you want to be through the variety of people that you interact with. So I think variety is just so important. Jenny, what, what's your sort of views on this? Because as someone who's a practicing scientist, you're bringing people through your lab, you're interacting with a lot of people in the community. I think, I mean, I totally agree with Lakeisha that you don't have to be mentored by someone who looks like you. And I, I too have had very good male mentors and 
I mentor men and I think it's she's hit the nail on the head. It's all about personality. You have to have a an empathy. You have to to meet somebody that you you admire if you're looking upwards or, or accept the admiration of someone who's who's just starting out in their career. Is there'll be something that clicks there, whether it's the personality or you're you're doing th things a certain way. And and I think I don't have much to add. It was such a beautiful answer, but I think people do get head up like, oh gosh, well we've got to have BME AME mentors. You know, we've got to find a bunch of ethnic minorities to mentor the ethnic minorities. And I and I think that is kind of missing the point. I think I think it's incredibly valid. Um, we have a few minutes left for Q and A. So if you do have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. We can't see the chat. We only see questions coming through in the Q&A. So please do pop them in there as well. And um, just as we're sort of starting to get towards the Q&A and wrapping up, I would like, I think, each of the panelists, if there's an event or an interaction in your life that really helped you, helped you feel like you belong in science, um, I think we'll start with uh, Anne Marie. Is there? Can you sort of ha do you have a memory encapsulated that helps you feel like you really belonged? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine if you don't. It's fine. It's a random um, question. Do I, well, I, I, do, I think. Um, do you know? It's funny because I I can't pick one moment. Um, I think it's the opposite for me. Is I that I can't pick a moment in my academic career that I've been made to feel like other in quite a profound way so I think mine is the opposite where my entire time and it's only now looking back and talking to other people and hearing about the awful things that happened to them that I'm like wow yeah like no one ever created a fake dating profile for me um, and used it to bully me on my course like there's all these things that people tell me and I'm like oh my goodness so I think for me I am throughout my whole career I was never made to feel like other and I know I'm really fortunate ha for having that um so either fortunate or not very perceptive because they, they probably were looking at me I just didn't realize so I think for me um you know I've, I've always had that sense of belonging and and if I'm being completely honest I think it's the maths and the computer science and the logic and the trustworthiness of them meant that they're my friends <laughs> and every day I wake up and I'm like, you know, life is so much more complicated. The, the, than numbers, the, maths. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers are your friend. Um, so, uh, Lakeisha, can you think of a, one particular? No, I just, I, yeah, I had to just agree with Anne Marie. I don't, I, it's this kind of thing when you hear people talking about, like, especially like racial experiences. And I'm like, did I just live in a bag my whole life? Like, I just feel <laughs> like she said, I just feel like I wasn't. I had rose tinted spectacles on, like I just didn't see it. Um, but um, I don't know. I think it kind of relates to what I was saying before about like getting invitations to various places. And I remember when I first started networking, I could literally like I'd stand outside the doors, like try and be like, okay, should I go in? Is it okay? Um, but having someone there that you know and and having that person to kind of like lead you and introduce you to people, that always is a, a really, really big thing for me um it makes you more comfortable in the situation but i can't think of anything specifically <laughs> I know, jenny have you got this this is turning out to be a bad question uh jenny have you got anything well yeah i mean i i encountered a lot of sexism when i was first starting out in research i was very young and, and very yeah. unconfident and i i it was really distressing to me because I really wanted to be a scientist, but it all got magically better when I started my PhD with a really super strong female supervisor, Julie Overbaugh, who is basically um, one of those wonderful scientists I've ever met. She was tough, but fair and 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 just um, showed me what, what, what was possible. And I did suddenly when I joined her lab, I felt like I was joining a family. And um, yeah, that really saved me because I think if I hadn't had that experience, I would have just written the whole thing off. Yeah, I, I'd like to wave my little flag for Mandy Fisher, who I worked in her lab. I did my last postdoc there and she's, you know, saved me in, in so many ways. I did ultimately leave science, but um, her mentorship was incredible. We've got a couple of questions. Um, I think this is one for Jenny as a researcher. Do you think the current reward system is affecting the situation that most rewards are given to those with the most grants and the most papers? and women and men who care about quality both in work and life get sidelined and not in leadership. Basically. That question is not so much a question as basically how I would exactly describe the situation. Um, there, the, the And I think um, Anna-Maria mentioned the, the, the output thing. It's completely warped. 
it's completely skewed toward people who have no lives, people who maybe have a wife at home cooking for them and looking after the kids. It's not fit for purpose in the modern era. And yes, until we turn that oil tanker around, it's always going to be the same. And, and I know that there are well-meaning people who are trying to. I see Atalie and uh, Laser's name has come up in the chat, but it is a massive oil tanker. And, and I really don't know how we're going to do it, but we, we have to do something. Yeah, sort of FERC coming on, we've got a question about how do we enroll allies? A lot of the merit system in science pushes the individual. Um, Dame Ottoline Laser talked about the broader community of science. So how do we actually reward being a good community member? Anne Marie, have you got some ideas about this? What does a, what do rewards look like for people who are doing the right thing? Well, we already have the rewards in our system. We just apply them incorrectly, right? So that, you know, whether it's pay, whether it's, it's seniority, if it's titles, if it's more time to study what you want to study, you know, if it's funding, there's there's kind of quite a lot of rewards that we have. I think like like Jenny just said, you kind of, part of turning the tank around means that you are rewarded for doing, let's say that DNI work, because we realise that it's actually core to, you know, the, the progression of science and the progression of, of whatever it is that we're trying to explore and understand. So I think you've got that kind of rewards. Um, Eugenia Chang, who I'm sure is part of this already, if she's not, then you know, that's, a, that's an idea for non for anyone that's listening. But, you know, she's written a great book now called X plus Y, looking at this idea of being congressive. And, you know, how do you reward that working together, that collaborative nature, rather than rewarding kind of competition? Uh, and that kind of thing. So there's there's kind of a there's a lot to lot to consider, a lot to to experiment with and try out. Um, but you know we 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 do already have the rewards. It's just applying them to the right behaviours. I couldn't agree more. I've got a question. I think probably I'm going to throw at Lakeisha, um, which is what should decolonization and inclusion look like in mathematics and computer science How about teaching differently? Because I think you know I, my background's in genetics, and it's just like it's a whole load of white men doing stuff. Um, so is, is, are there ways that we should be teaching to make people see that there is more to life than the history of white men doing clever things? Well, there's always that like, um, I don't know if it's a story that says like the test was to climb a tree and they gave it to a fish and an elephant and a tiger and like not everyone can do it exactly the same and it's not the right test. Um, I think I think the media is helping out with this in terms of kind of creating this diverse history of those sort of like underlying people that no one really knew were parts of things. Um, I think the more we dig into history, the more we find out and we bring these stories to light, I think that's really going to help with that. Um, but just in terms of going forward, I think it's really important to just engage a variety of different ways. Um, to just engage the mind, especially with students, it's it's really tough to give everyone the same exam when it's a group of people that are completely diverse. So I think we should really think about that going forward. Can I add to that? Mm. Sure. I think I think the in addition to everything Nikisha said, I think we also have to be very, like I said, kind of intentional and tactical within it. So if we look at maths. You know how many how many people know about Gladys West? Who would be another? There's so many people I'd love to nominate. I mean, I have to talk to you after about this afterwards. But you know, Gladys West is the reason we have that blue dot that we follow around in GPS. And she did the mathemat mathematics. She wrote the mathematical paper about ge geostatic satellites, right? And so there's something about telling those stories and having that as part of the curriculum, not just the dead white guys. As much as they did lots, it wasn't just dead white guys. We do need to talk about people that aren't dead white and men, because I'm never going to be a dead white man, and neither is Gladys. But I think it's also talking about the practical application of what we have with it, maths and computer science, which, mm. you know, I think people want you to study computer science for the love of computer science, which works for me and has worked before. But actually going forward, that's not going to be enough. And so when you think of even Black Lives Matter, you know, how much more has that movement been able to to be and do well recently because of computer science? If we weren't all online, if we didn't have those video cameras in our pockets, you know, for, for decades they've been working on, we wouldn't have been able to have a nine and a half minute video that unfortunately had to, had to happen and was shared. You know, there's so much that computer science has been able to do for us in our world. And none of that is reflected in the curriculum. And the same with maths. A lot of it isn't reflected in what we teach and how we teach it. And so when we talk about decolonizing, there are so many examples of black people, of Asian people, of women who we don't know. It's always the same Brunel, Newton, dead, dead white dudes. So I think, you know, day one, DFE tomorrow, if anyone's listening, just some other names. 
Sometimes in the textbooks, <laughs> in the curriculum, you know, I, <laughs> I don't want to talk too much. So I'll stop after this. But I, I recently wrote this maths book, How to Be a Maths Whiz. And it was really interesting having discussions with the publishers where I was like, look, you've written Newton and Einstein. And that's just not what I'm going to put in the book. I think they've had their yeah. time. Then yeah. Can you write about someone else? Can we commit to having a year where we don't mention Ada Lovelace and Marie Curie? Like, I don't know. Like, just, just, just uh. sacrilege. Come on, Kat, stop it. <laughs> I don't know. Just one year where we don't mention their names and think more. Um, we unfortunately we do have to wrap up, but I, I want one very, very quick thing from each one of you, and this is a, a great question. If you had one thing to say to the next generation of young girls what would it be uh, coming into science presumably related to that? Um, we'll start with uh, Jenny. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you won't succeed. Just don't listen to them. Fantastic. Lakeisha. Your mind is bigger than you anticipated. Just tap into it. Um, Anne-Marie. If you want to change the world in any way, join us. And if you're an evil genius, then you can also join us. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. We love that. I think that's, that's an amazing place to end it. Oh, so there were many more questions. I'm so sorry we couldn't come to all the questions. Um, we did want to keep this event to an hour and I'm, I'm really sorry for the questions that we didn't come to. Uh, they were absolutely fantastic. I will say thank you so much to our panel. And, um, you know, please do keep the conversation going in the chat. Uh, do put your feedback about the panel, uh, questions that you'd like to see maybe the suffrage science commu community answering and, and working towards. But it is time to wrap up and we are now going to show you our second short film, which is celebrating this year's awardees in maths and computing. So please do sit back and enjoy. I'm delighted to introduce to you the fabulous Sara Lombardo, to whom I'm passing on my heirloom jewelry. Uh, so the first question is why me? Perhaps because uh, uh, Eugenie and I, we both share the same urgency um, towards a more inclusive environment. Three things about women in science I want to change. Boy, I don't think there's anything that I want to change about women in science. I think women in science are fantastic. It is the environment, everything else that needs changing. And this is certainly not a women's problem. Why do I think Ruth has nominated me for the award? I really have no idea. Um, I realize that's a stereotypically female answer. Um, but in this case, it really happens to be the truth. So I look forward to hearing what Ruth has to say. Something I particularly appreciate about Rianne is that if you go to her with a tricky problem, then she really thinks hard about it and typically comes up with some clever solution that you never would have thought of yourself. I've chosen to pass the award on to Sue, Sue Sentence, because uh, she's been doing some excellent work in looking at how children learn computer science, how we teach computer science, and also um, diversity in computer science education. I'd like to see more focus on education across the whole scientific field, as discipline-based education research seems to hold the lowest status of all scientific research. The main challenge is not so much the research areas as uh, the leadership roles that these uh, female scientists may play in those areas. I chose Juyan because her research combines mathematical rigor with important practical applications. She brings together classical statistics and the ability to solve problems from a variety of disciplines. It was a complete surprise. Perhaps she saw that my diverse activities in teaching and research should be recognized more. I may want the lights to switch on when I get to the front door, but I certainly don't want to be standing on the doorstep in the rain while the software switches on the burglar alarm instead. Professor Yoshida has developed important theoretical ideas that underpin the development of software 
that correctly interacts with other systems. The reason why Ursula has chosen me is, I guess, she has been observing how I overcame several personal and professional difficulties and grew my research team as well as a scientific community of my research areas. Why did you choose Apala as a recipient of this award? I chose Apala because she demonstrates the heights to which you can take uh, strong, mathematically based interdisciplinary science. The girls and school children, they were encouraged to think outside the box, if they were encouraged to take more risks. I think that would help attract more people to the field and also help retain more people in the field because there is a certain element of risk and uncertainty in research. First of all, thank you, Daniela, for nominating me. How have you managed to remain so positive and so generous in a world that is increasingly more cynical, as I'm sure you have experienced lately? What would I change about women in science? I would try to make women realise that the career in science is within reach. I'm not quite sure how to go about it. Microaggressions and small misogynist behaviours make it a constant battle sometimes to be a woman in science. And I would like that to stop so that we could focus on our passion, which is the science itself. My research career has some similarities to that of James and we both share a passion to increase diversity in computing. Along the years, Jane has been an inspiration, so I'm really honoured to have been nominated by her. The thing about women in science I would like to change is just more. More of us in more institutions, in more roles, because the expectation to be a woman in science should be as normal as the expectation to be a man in science. I would like to see much greater recognition of women in science um, in the past. So that is starting to happen, but very, very little. And I think there's a whole lot more that can be done. One of the new exciting areas is what I'm calling in others humane AI. This refers to thinking about how we can design uh, future AI, AI technologies that can augment people and empower them rather than replace them. Now in 2008, she co-wrote a paper on being human HCI in the year 2020. Now in this, one prediction was the always available culture that we have today. And the other is the growth of techno dependency. Well, they were right about that. The three things about women in science that I want to change are um, how they are valued by the rest of society, how they are perceived by the next generation, and finally, how many of them are black female professors. One thing I'm looking forward to seeing change about women in mathematics is that when there is a gender balance, we will stop noticing women in mathematics. I would like to be just a person in mathematics. me myself thank you very much to Kiki von Glasso and her team for making the film and Marie you're one of the recipients have you got your your jewelry with you what have you got I've got true to what the video said I've got this which I think is one of the scrolls from the difference machine I think that's what it is absolutely beautiful they are incredible pieces of work aren't they 
They are. I kind of don't want to give it away, but I guess I've got two years to make the most of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I really, the thing that came out for me from, from that video, uh, a couple of things, and, and the life sciences video before, is the idea that, you know, that, that we don't have a problem with women in science. We have a problem with science. Like it, it's the environment and it's the culture. And at some point when we do have equal representation, it won't, it won't be weird and we will be making the environment around us. I, I just thought as we wrap up a, a little reaction to what we've seen and what we've discussed uh, from each of the panel, let's start with Jenny. Well, everything that struck me about the, the people in the videos was, was sort of the hope and the, and the, and the congeniality and the, the sorority. And, and I just find that so inspiring. And I think when women are pulled together, regardless of the color of their skin, and, and also when, when we pull together with our allies, uh, we can really make a big difference. Lakeisha? I like the comment someone made about being a person in science. I think all of us here are trying to work ourselves out of our jobs <laughs> and um, create this real normality about how we see individuals in different sectors. So um, that's really hopeful. I liked that. Yeah, it's like we don't wake up and go, yeah, I'm a woman. It's like I'm a person. I got to get up and like put my shoes on. Um, Anne-Marie. I like the cartoon. Someone sent in a cartoon, which I really liked. I, I was like, I wish I did that. I wish I was cool like that. <laughs> having a bad hair day. Um, if you want to know more about any of our, our maths and computing awardees, there will be interviews coming up in early 2021 on the, uh, the London Institute of Medical Sciences website. And as we wrap up, um, it's, it's just been such a wonderful evening. I've had a wonderful time in my living room. I hope you've all had a wonderful time wherever you've been at home. And thank you so much for taking the time on a Friday night to join us. And again, I am so sad that we cannot all be together in, in person and now cracking open the cheap Prosecco and having a really lovely time because I've got one canapé left. I've been sneakily eating them through this event. But before we go, there are lots of thanks as always. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much to our panelists. So that's Anne-Marie, Imafadon, Lakeisha Jean and Jenny Rohn. Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, it was inspirational having little chats with you in the week as we were setting this up. And it's just been a lovely discussion tonight. So thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank all the 2018 and 2020 awardees in the life sciences and maths and computing for your time in making our little videos and in, in handing over the awards to each other. Thank you. Also, thanks to our sponsor, L'Oreal, very long standing supporter of the suffrage science scheme. They've uh, kindly provided our 2018 and 2020 awardees with goodie bags and also me. Thank you very much. It was very nice. Uh, thanks to Kiki von Glasso for the films and the technical team at Amplitude e for making this whole event happen online. It was a bit of a nightmare switching from we're going to do it in person, then we're going to do it as a mix, and now we're doing it online. But uh, they've really made it happen, so thank you. And of course, the team at the LMS behind Suffrage Science, a huge thanks to Professor Amanda Fisher and uh, Viv Parry, but particularly Mandy for just getting the scheme going, keeping it going and being an uh, incredibly inspirational woman in science and the team behind it, Katie Pallister, Susan Watts and Sophie Arthur. And uh, they've just done an amazing job organising all of this. And as things have changed and moved, it's it's been a big job for them. So huge round of applause for them. Thank you very much. So please do continue the conversations. Um, hopefully you've all been having conversations in the chat. Do continue the conversations, reach out, contact by email. This is a wonderful network, supportive network. There are mentors, there are allies out there. So, so let's use them, let's find them. Uh, the portal, this portal, will be active until Friday. A recording of the event will be made available fairly soon, but you can watch it, re-watch it, the glory hour that we've just had, you can watch again until Friday. Please, 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 do fill in the feedback form. I think it's up there. Fill it in. It would be really helpful to know what you think of the event. And uh, just a quick heads up about some other women in science and other equality things that are going on from the, the MRC London Institute of Medical Sciences. So we've got the Women of the World of Science Allies and Mentoring Scheme in Africa. So uh, this is WOWS. And uh, Katie will pop a link in the chat about that. So this is a mentoring scheme bringing together researchers with scientists in Africa to help support them and, and bring forward women scientists in Africa. And also these fabulous little books called Pioneers of Progress, which are the stories of women in science. They're some of my favourites in here. We've got Dorothy Hodgkin. We've got Barbara McClintock, Elsie Widdowson. Uh, you can tell I'm a biologist. Uh, those are my favourites. I'm very, very biased. But uh, you can also get those through the, uh, the LMS website. So please do go and check them out. They're just fantastic stories looking at some inspirational women in the history of science and technology. So next year, 
is the 10th year of the suffrage science scheme. We're going to mark the occasion with a podcast series. We're going to have the fifth engineering physical sciences awards event, and it will be on International Women's Day in March 2021. And do look forward to, to bringing the community together. We'll be sharing the details of that event with you. And maybe we'll meet in person and eat those canapes and drink that warm, cheap Prosecco together. Maybe we'll have some expensive Prosecco because we saved the money on it this year. But it's been an absolute privilege to host tonight. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks to the panel. Thanks, everyone. And I'm going to wrap up now. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>